rap world's biggest star was murdered last night. My son was shot. I'm mailing it back with Brad Furman, and he is the director of City of Lies. Hi, Brad. Hi, pleasure. Thank you for having me. So what do you think of my backdrop? I, as I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm very, I'm a fan of that location and that, 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 that moment in the movie. So tell, let's go back to that. Tell, tell, tell me a little bit about shooting that day, what it was like. That was a really hectic day because I was insistent on doing that as a one -er. And it's a, it's an immensely complex one -er with a ton of moving pieces and the sun was going down as you can actually see behind you. So we were fighting the elements, so to speak. Also, um, we were only at that location for, I think it was two days or a day and a half, because we also had to shoot all the, the car stuff and the chase and all that stuff that opens the film. So it was a lot. We, even though we're a bigger film compared to, you know, an under five or $10 million movie, we still had tremendous limitations and you have to, you know, you got to set the mark and you have to deliver. But this was a real challenge, but we had wonderful professionals. Jacques Joffre was the operator carrying the camera and we shot it handheld, not steady cam. And he's just, he's unbelievable. And Johnny just incredibly hits his marks. I mean, boy, is he a professional. So uh, I was very, very proud. And uh, everybody in the scene, which I always is, is everyone is real. Um, from the forensics to the photographer, Sergio Robledo, our um, tech supervisor, who was Russ Poole's um, supervisor at the LAPD, and also the lead detective on the Wallace civil case. Um, he was our tech advisor, sadly passed away um, since the movie, um, but a wonderful man who helped bring all the real people um, from the ambulance workers to everyone to the scene. Even the um, all, undercover cops are real. So we, everybody's real. So let's unpack this a little bit, Brad. Uh, first sure. of all, Johnny, um, I have to tell you, I interviewed Johnny when he was on 21 Jump Street. So oh, I'm, I'm oh. showing you my age a little bit. <laughs> That's a great story. I love it. And I knew then he was going to be a huge, huge star. Mm -hmm. So tell me about his transformation for this role. I couldn't tell if he put on a couple of pounds, if he was wearing some padding. Talk about him creating... In, in, an idea, in an ideal world, I wanted to break the movie into two so we could shoot it in pieces and he could gain the weight. Um, him and I spoke a lot about process in the beginning and his organic nature and his allergy to formula, which I love when he when he speaks of that, because um, I knew he would bring this eccentric sort of off center look at at the version of Russ Poole, which would be the most interesting. Um, but really, I, I was keyed in on not using prosthetics. I know he had had a lot of success with certain prosthetics and films, and I wanted to go more old school and natural with the makeup. So, um, you know, Johnny did put on some weight, but we also figured out, you know, with the extra padding as well, how to balance those things. Because, you know, I think I felt that to differentiate him, we needed more weight. But then his, you know, wonderful makeup team and everyone really just worked very hard to create two sort of distinguished characters. Um, and, you know, for where Johnny's at in his life and his age, I think he looks great. So aging him up was 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 fun in ways. Yeah. And of course, this was shot three years ago. So I'm wondering, did you feel like you had that freedom to go back to it and make changes or you just were happy the way it was? I, I wanted to, my, my goal was after, you know, the, you know, Open Road going under, the first distributor, and then Global Road going bankrupt, and sort of the, a lot of the pushback, which is sort of hard to define exactly, of people not wanting the movie to come out, and institutionally not wanting the movie to come out. Um, They're crazy. Yeah, it, it, it's, been a, it's been a long ride, but um, I would say that, you know, for me, I, I did have some things as a perfectionist that I wanted to adjust in the film that we just weren't given the opportunity. But what I keep coming back to for me is that I made the movie because I felt that the story needed to be told. And I felt a deep responsibility to the Wallace family, Miss Wallace and the Poole family. And I, I really felt that that was what is and, and was most important. So regardless of whether people think the movie is good or bad, or I'm a perfectionist and get to change it or not change it. Um, I, I, I wanted the movie to get out into the world because that's why we made it. And there's always these financial restraints and there's time restraints that go hand in hand with the finances. And this was an opportunity which was like, take it or leave it. And I said, I'll take it and we'll take the movie into the world. And uh, 
you know, hey, maybe one day I'll go tinker with it down the line. But for now, I, I stand proudly behind the story and the film and I'm just happy it's finally coming out. I really loved it, by the way. Oh, so thank you very much. So riveting and mesmerizing, and and wow, what performances you got! Um, not only Johnny, but you had the real people, like you said, in the film. So were you concerned at all that maybe they couldn't pull it off, that they couldn't act? You always have those concerns, but I, I had to find a balance in this movie of striving to take it out of movie land. And the minute you step into the big star universe of these gigantic, you know, heavyweight actors, you step into a version of movie land. Like, how do you remove Johnny Depp? How do you create it so that you're watching Forrest Whitaker or Johnny and it's the characters and it's not them? So there was a lot of conscious decisions that the ideal way to have it unfold was that it would affect the subconscious of the viewer. So um, there's a balancing act, casting great character actors and some new actors and unknown actors, casting real people, bringing Miss Wallace to the table to play herself, um, you know, using, uh, not, not recreating Tupac and Biggie, but, you know, because I didn't think that anybody could embody the spirit and replicate who they were as individuals on the screen. I felt that that would take us into a world that felt fake and I was trying to keep it grounded and real. So when Biggie's in the car on the way to the tragic ending that he has, that's a real interview and real conversation that was recorded that we embedded in there. We embedded his vocals to try to, in the music and the score to try to bring out the humanity of him and, and his presence in the film. We take a moment of silence in the middle of the movie for Tupac Shakur. So there's all these elements that exist that I, I wove into the fabric of the film that try to find a balance of truth and less fiction, but there is obviously fiction in the amalgamation of things for the, you know, telling the, the story on a, on a limited time. But, um, you know, just how do you balance these things so it feels real and raw and honest? Maybe that's the right word, honest. Yeah. So if we were like a fly in the wall, what were some of your conversations with Valetta Wallace and Megan Poole about and, and with Johnny as well? When, when I met Miss Wallace over the phone, I was really nervous and anxious because I understood in the gravity of this. And that's sort of what I was speaking to. It's a movie, but it's really a movie about a very hard hitting true story about this woman that lost her son to, to murder and to the failure of an institution and to the police. Um, but, but beyond that, he was a father to you know, these children. And um, you know, Russ Poole had lost his life in theory and practice in dedicating it to the fight for justice and truth for Miss Wallace and her family. So there was a unique tie between the Pools and the Wallaces that is an unbreakable one. And when we shot Miss Wallace on set, you know, uh, Megan Poole was behind me and, and she was just in tears, bawling. It was just so, so painful for her to go back there and to relive her, that and to have Johnny, you know, recreate the aura of her husband and her children were there. And so there's a lot of really, um, you know, really challenging things. But um, I know that, that the way I feel today is, um, you know, Christopher and Russ are no longer here. So I think there's a responsibility that since they aren't here to fight that fight, we have to fight it for them. And I think that's surely the way that Miss Wallace feels. And I was very proud to stand side by side with the Poole family and the Wallace family in that fight for truth and justice. And, and that's what the movie represents. Well, speaking of truth and justice, you seem to have that theme running through your films. Um, do, do, do you see that as well? Um, yeah, I mean, surely with the infiltrator and then, uh, you know, Mick Holler's dance and yeah, actually, for, yeah, actually you, you, you nailed it uh, in all of them, actually. Yeah. That's the right. Lincoln lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking as I went back. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. So. So, so I'm going to shrink you a little bit. Um, where do you think this comes from? Um, I, by nature, I've always questioned everything. Well, even if it came from my parents or someone I deeply trust, I, I always had this very questioning nature. I also found that you're introduced as a young child to systems that you're told this is how things work. And I always wondered like, but I don't see it that way. It doesn't work that way. Why can't you do it this way? That was inherent in me. But then I think we see the failures of systems um, and then the larger failures of certain bureaucratic things that really always shook me and made me think twice. And then also to be 
you know, respectfully honest, the opportunity and honor that I have to sit with you today, Robin, is because I didn't listen to everyone when they told me all the things that you have to do to be a filmmaker. If you do this, 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 and this, and I feel like if I did those things, I would not actually have the honor of sitting here with you today. I actually had to break the rules and live in the gray and bend the rules and slip through the cracks the way that Mickey Holler did. So I always understood that character very deeply. And um, I, I like to believe that in this short life that we all have, because you know, as time is moving so quickly, we do have to like take responsibility for how we treat others and the world that we leave behind for you know, our children and our children's children. And I think that this is just a small piece of that. It's, it's very easy and not trying to be morbid from a top down perspective to think that, you know, oh, well, we're pretty inconsequential in the scheme of the life in the universe. But while we're here, um, I want to milk it for all it's worth. And that's really what I'm trying to do. And I think City of Lies is a graduation into, you know, more formative, uh, mature subject matters. Um, and this was important to me and I hope it's important to other people. Well, thank you for that lovely compliment, by the way. <laughs> no, I mean it genuinely. I love your backdrop. Speaking of backdrops, you're a big music guy. Look at the, look at all yeah. those albums. Wow. Um, so they were actually, which was a big turning point in my life, they were my cousin Michael Furman's albums before he passed away. And I lost him at a very young age. And it really changed my life because it put mortality into perspective. And I think that catapulted me into the drive um, that I had to live a fulfilled life and pursue my dreams, but also hopefully let him live vicariously through me in the sense that he can't pursue those things anymore. But he was a very successful DJ um, he, and I, you know, his records were left behind and I spoke to my aunt and uncle and I said, they're really important to me. So I've added to them, it's a huge collection, it's inspiring. Music is incredibly inspiring to me and transformative. So. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's really, it's defining of the beginnings for me. So I appreciate you seeing it there. Yeah, I mean, you you were like, you worked with the B before anybody else did. <laughs> Justin is a, a wonderful, you know, he's a, he's a man now, but he was a younger man when I had him. And I was very proud to work with Justin and really proud of his commitment and effort. It was, it was, it was rewarding for both of us. And I don't know if you, if you know the irony of Matthew McConaughey and Johnny Depp, but the Lincoln lawyer, led to his commercial doing the Lincoln commercial. Yes, yes. And Johnny Depp was considered for the role before Matthew, did you know? Oh, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. Johnny <laughs> grabbed Dior instead, so. That's right. <laughs> there you go. Well, they're both, they're both making money on those things, so good for them, for sure. We call our car the McConaughey, hey, hey, hey. We got one, we got a Lincoln. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. You know, I remember the world where big movie stars wouldn't do domestic campaigns like that. Uh, I sort of like that world better. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it, it seems to break down the mystique of seeing them on the big screen. But all of this is changing with the advent of how we watch movies today on our phones and in our homes and streaming instead of theatrical. And I, I'm still stuck a little bit in the old school. But um, I, I'm very honored. All my movies have received theatrical releases, even this one. So, um, you know, it's it. I, I I take that. I take some pride in that. But I'm also I have perspective of how lucky I am. So you think of ever sort of going back to your beginnings and doing another music video someday, or are you just going to stick with features? Uh, I yeah. I think the collaboration when you actually work directly with the artist is really really rewarding. Um, the notion of writing these treatments, which is really the process in a vacuum, and then you submit a whole bunch or submit it to the label and the artist is, it's, it's, it's stupefyingly numbing and, and unartistic in its process. Um, but really collaborating directly with the artist, I find to be really rewarding. And that's what Justin and I did. That whole skate park was actually not my idea. The skate park was was born out of him wanting to do something that was who he was. And that's great. That's what that union is. So the larger idea was mine and we built it into the skate park. And um, yeah, I was really proud of that collaboration. And and so if it makes sense with Justin or whomever, I'm always open. So, so then how did Johnny um, bring his own collaboration into um, City of Lies? Johnny... Um, it's like an ambassador for truth, um, which is interesting, you know, collectively with everything. He, he put up this quote recently about truth being a rare bird. Um, 
he brought those sentiments the minute we sat down together. He brought the sentiments about his own belief in the fight for justice, his sentiments about the impact that Christopher had had on him as an artist, um, the music in particular, and you know all the great artists. Uh, Rage Against the Machine is it licensed that track for us as a result of Johnny's relationship with them, um, which was super cool. Killer Mike is in the movie and from Run the Jewels, and he's a wonderful you know political and social activist. Also through Johnny's relationship, um, we were flirting with other great artists that Johnny had relationships with. So I think collectively, um, Johnny's imprint on this movie is so much greater than um, just being an actor. Joe Perry plays from Aerosmith, plays all the guitar on the score. Oh, wow. Um, and that was also through Johnny. And we recorded at Johnny's studio when we, uh, Alberto Boff and I made a portion of the score, uh, Chris Hazen's sort of emotional score was separate of that. But, um, you know, his imprint and fight for the movie and the story and for justice and truth was is all over the film. And uh, I, I was very honored to share in that journey with him. Wonderful. And what, and so are you working on anything now that you can tell us about? I'm, I'm working on a ton of stuff, but I'm, I'm, I haven't exactly figured out what's next because I'm just figuring out how to resolve this in completion and take a deep breath. And that that's really what I'm looking for, that deep breath at the end of this. And just the hope that this movie reaches people in a way that gets them to look at themselves and, you know, look in the mirror and think about how each of us as individuals can make better decisions and hopefully collectively, you know, make changes and hold these institutions responsible and, um, you know, create some change. And it's a lofty goal, but, um, you know, maybe this is just a start. I think you took the words out of my mouth because I was, I was going there. So do you feel vindicated now that you've done the film and it's out? Is there, is there that feeling? No, I, I, I feel the film and the story is so much bigger than me. And that sort of comes full circle to your question about what I would or wouldn't change. The movie for me is, it's not, it's a movie, but you know, when Miss Wallace is sitting there talking to the fake Russ Poole and the fake Jack Jackson, it's not fake for her. And so that's what this is about for me. It's not fake for Megan Poole. It's not fake for the kids. So um, that, that to me is where this movie lands in, in, in the truth of the lives lost that of lives that shouldn't have been lost. And um, just to give you perspective, there's a quote from this guy, Michael Bennett, who formerly played for the Seattle Seahawks and Tom Brady's jersey, I don't know if you would remember this, went missing because it was stolen after the Super Bowl a few years ago. And, and the government went to great lengths to hunt the jersey down. And I think a few days later or 48 hours later, they found it in Mexico. And Michael Bennett was being interviewed and he's like, we could find Tom Brady's jersey, but 20 years later, we can't solve, you know, Biggie and Pox murders. And I just think in its simplicity, that just says everything. Yeah, yeah. It's a conundrum. <laughs> well, yeah, people, they don't want it to be solved. And, and the reasons for that are in the film. And, it, and it's, it's devastating. It really is. So, um, you know, when you keep that in perspective, all of this is much bigger than me. I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just sort of here to hopefully, you know, maybe light a small spark that lights something bigger. We'll see. Very cool. Watch City of Lies. It's definitely worth it. I love this film so much really truly thank you so much brad thanks robin thanks for the kind words and the time it really means a lot i appreciate it okay take good care you have any suspects ain't no name dropping say my name assassinating as long as it's an ongoing investigation some evidence stays locked away in the dark Always news. Always refreshing. Always candid. Always billing about. Robin Milling delivers what celebrities are saying to you. To you. To you.